All right, so we are recording. Let's just double check the audio is good, the video is good. Okay. All right, so we are now proceeding to、uh, talk about how we call and return from a subroutine. So from your perspective, it is going to be. We are on this particular module at this point.、Um, there are a few things. Okay, so you probably want to learn how to、uh, be how to be able to trace the execution of a program. You know when your program is you're running in PTP, so that's going to be really useful at this point of time.、Um, and the way to do that is,、um, so I'm going to demonstrate that first, and then we can kind of go back to the main topics. So you can use this approach. Okay, if you click on this particular document, it will <laughs> nice. That's because okay, it's still here. All right, so this is somebody's your know, project, your know,、uh, from a while back. So this is a combination of the assembler, the TTP emulator, and also the ability to trace the execution of a program that I have not used myself. Okay, this is actually a student project. Some some、uh, student in the past decided to take this on about five years ago, but the TTP has not changed. So that means you know this tool should still work, but you have to compile that to let to make it run. Um, the source code is all here.、Um, the instruction of how to use it is all here as well. So that's one resource that you can use、uh, to be able to be able to trace the execution of your program. So that's one. <clears throat> the other one is、um, to continue to use Logisim and then use the logging ability of Logisim to trace the execution of programs. So、um, if you're using a Mac or Linux,、uh, Riffspider.zip you know, should work. On the other hand, if you're using、uh, Windows, then you have to go to Omer's、um, your project, which is also a port.、Um, you once you click this, it it will take you to GitHub again. But this is a different project.、Um, basically, with this one, you can configure a Windows machine, including the lab machine here, to basically do the same thing as what I usually do with Ripper Spider. Now, failing all that, okay, because you know, none of these is "quote unquote" an easy process. They are all somewhat involved, okay. So you have to read the instructions carefully and follow the instructions step by step. Failing all of that, okay, you can still have another approach of doing things. So let me try to figure, find out where I put that. I may not. Yep, there we go. So this particular slide here talks about how to trace PTP ASM code execution. But without the use of you know just about any resource other than the command line tool, because you already have Logisim, you need Logisim to get TTP to work anyway. So with that, and also knowing it's a know-how you know knowing thing, so you just have to be able, you just have to know how to work with the、uh, assembler,、uh, particularly you know, what to do with trace raw data in order to give you the actual analysis, which is you know the path you know the, the execution result. So there are a few ways to do this, but I just think that at this point, being able to know exactly how your program ran in TTP is going to be very useful. Not only from the perspective of writing the code, but also from the perspective of understanding the concept. Because you know, if I talk about the concepts, it's all kind of abstract. You don't really see what is going on. What? How is the register getting changed? What are we writing into RAM? Which location are we reading back at a certain point in time? So, but when you look at this, it is much more concrete. You know exactly which instruction executes at what time and what it did. You know when the program executes. So I think this is going to be a really useful tool. All right. So let me see what you guys want to do. So do you want me to kind of briefly go over you know how to do this without using Ripper Spider, which is something that you have to install and configure? Or is this not important to you at this point in time? Hmm. Go over. Okay. So I can go over the approach. You know that is the quote unquote easiest one. So、um, I'll go over that. <clears throat> so you have a source code. You have a program. I'm going to use you know, exactly the same program in this case. So this is the program that you want to run, and you don't want to find out what happens when this program runs. So the way to do that using the the most、um, direct approach, which which means you don't have to install anything, you don't have to configure anything, 
is to learn how to use or you know, remind yourself how to use the command line tool to run Logisync. Okay. Um, so I am going to have to download the code. So you have to go to the RAM file. So you might want to jot down the timestamp and kind of put a label next to the timestamp of this is how we trace the execution of a program. Okay. So, you know, at least do that part so that it's easier for you to go back and look up the video and know what you're looking for. All right. <clears throat> so you go to RAM file and then you go to file, you go to download. So these steps we have, I have explained already because this is how you run programs in Logisim anyway. So you download a CSV file and, you know, I just like to name the file, you know, you know, with something. So I'll just call demo one. Okay. So demo one dot CSV is the content of the RAM file. And then you switch back onto the command line and you start up Logisim. But the way you start up Logisim, I'm just going to get to the temp folder here, um, is the, I always, you know, kind of, do it the long way. Um, you can probably use a batch file or something like that to kind of simplify the process. I'll explain that in just a little bit too. So you uh, do a Java dash jar, and then the first thing you need to specify is where do you find logisim 310.jar. So mine is put here. So the way you specify your path can be very different depending on what operating system you're using. So in Windows, you know, I have another a uh, link in the Canvas shell to show you how to work with the file system in Windows. Okay, so I, so if you read that and you still don't know how to, what to do, you know, let me know. All right, so 310, and I think I put it in the processor subfolder, and you know, that's the jar file. So when, when if I press enter right now, it just starts up Logisim without bringing in the processor. So if I want to bring in the processor as well, then I have to specify the path to the processor 0004.cert file. So if I press the enter key now, it's gonna start up Logisim with the processor loaded in it, okay? But that's also not what, this is not what I want either because I want to preload, okay, the content into that um, processor, into the RAM component. So I have to use the dash load and then we specify the path to the file that I just downloaded from the assembler which I call demo1.csv. If I press the enter key now, the command line you know, interface is gonna complain because your dash load will only work in the command line mode and not in the GUI mode. So now I have to specify dash tty table, which forces uh, Logisim to run the program, but in the command line, and it will give me the trace of all the uh, pins, all the output pins. So I can press the enter key now. And it just gives you a bunch of zeros and ones, which is really difficult for a person to interpret. Um, so what we want to do is to do a right, um, a greater than symbol. I think this screen is probably better because it doesn't have the screen you know, shining on it. So we use a greater than symbol to basically mean we are redirecting the output to a file. So you can name the file anything you want. I just want to be consistent. So I'm going to call it demo1.tsv. TSV stands for tab separated value, okay? So if I do this and I press the enter key, it would as it, would, it seems like there's nothing happening, but that's only because the output, which you see at the upper portion of the command line interface is now captured into that file, which is a tab separated value file. So are there any questions at this point or are we, are we good at this point, okay? So once we have the TSV, then we switch back into Logisim, not Logisim, sorry, I take it back. We switch back to the assembler, and then we go to trace raw data tab, okay, which is you know, the, one of the ones all the way to the right-hand side. <clears throat> and then at this point, you go to file, and then you click on import. And obviously, if you want to kind of make your own notes of how to do this, you can take screenshots, and kind of paste all the screenshots into one single document. So this way, you know, you can, you have your own document to kind of help you remember the steps of doing all of this. So you go to browse and then the file is demo1.tsv that I put into the temp folder. So I just double click on that one, it uploads the file. So this is also important. This is also one of the places where you know, a screenshot may be helpful is you have to select replace current sheet here. And then you also want to turn off uh, specify tab 
specifically for the separator type, and then turn off convert text to numbers, dates, and formulas. And then you click import data. So I know there are many steps in this process, okay? But once you have done it a few times, it should not bother you as much. So now we have all the data in. So once we have all the data in, then you can go to the analysis tab. So the analysis tab makes use of the trace raw data tab in order to do the analysis. So now we have you know, the whole thing. It shows you um, at which location in RAM we, did we get the opcode. In other words, column A is reflecting all the fetch cycle in um, instruction execution. Uh, column G is reflecting exactly which line in, okay, I take it back. <laughs> column F tells you exactly on which line you know, are we referring to in the source tab, and then column G would actually mirror that line so that you don't have to look back and forth. We do okay so far? So the all the columns in between, which are column B, C, and D, and also E, they reflect what is happening or what happened when that particular instruction executes. So in the case of the no op instruction, nothing happened. I mean, would you expect anything else when the instruction itself has a mnemonic of no op? Okay, so that's kind of, okay, we kind of get it, right? So with LDI A1, okay, this is what happened when the instruction executed. Um, location 03 was red, okay, and there's a 60. You can ignore that, okay, when there's an LDI instruction, you can ignore column B. But what is important is column D is telling you that register A is now updated to 01, okay? So the syntax of each column is C syntax. So in this case, you know, it is an assignment operator, which means whatever A was is overwritten by 01, which is in hexadecimal. Okay, so it shows you exactly what happens when a particular instruction executes. The next one is LDIB negative one, and the effect of that particular instruction execution is B is now getting in hexadecimal FF. Does that make sense to you? That FF is representing negative one in signed representation. Okay, so the way, so this is something that you can also do is when you look at something like this, you go like, okay, does it make sense to me? Um, what is FF? It's one, 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 one. What is the signed interpretation of one, 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 one? It is one plus two plus four plus eight plus 16 plus 32 plus 64 minus 128. Is that some negative one? So you have to double check, okay? So whenever you encounter something that you're not super familiar with, it's like, oh, yep, I got that. You can always use whatever you have learned already to double check that. Okay, but that's, but I digress. <clears throat> so now we have a compare B A instruction, which means we are subtracting A, we are subtracting the value of A from the value of B as registers. So we are basically subtracting A one from FF, okay? So the binary subtraction does not care whether the bit patterns are supposed to be interpreted signed or unsigned. It just performs the operation, and then the flags are affected by this instruction because it is a compare instruction. The only side effect of the compare instruction are the flags because it does not change, in this case, register B. So now you have to ask, does it make sense that there's no carry or borrow? Yeah, there should be no borrow because FF is representing 255 unsigned, so 255 is greater than or equal to one, so that means there should be no borrow in this subtraction. Is the result zero? No, because you know, 255 minus one is 254, that is not zero. Uh, does the result have the sign bit being a one? It makes sense, because 254 has bit seven being a one, and the sign bit is really just bit seven of the result of the operation. Uh, overflow is a zero, does that make sense? It does make sense, okay, because we are subtracting a non-negative value from a negative value and we end up with a negative value. Okay, that happens, okay, so the sign of the result makes sense, which means overflow is a zero. And then the L flag is the exclusive or between the sign and the overflow flag, so we have one exclusive or with zero, which is one. Okay, so I have just explained these five flags 
but using things that we should have learned a long time ago. Okay, when we talk about signed versus unsigned representation, when we talk about binary comparison, that's where all of this is coming from. So, um, but once again, I digress. So now we have a JLI to L1 instruction. So now the question is, um, should we take that branch or not? Looking at the L flag being a one, we should take that branch. Branch. So that means we should continue execution at L1. So now we look at the next instruction. Are we at location, um, the location corresponding to label L1? If you're not, if you say, okay, I'm not really sure. Okay, you know, is, are we really at location L1? Then you go to the assemble tab, and then you look at the definition of L1. It is at location 0D. So that means, oh, okay, all right. So we actually took the branch to continue execution at location 0D, which then do a CPRLCA, which is copy register. The copying or anything that updates is always the right-hand side, provides the source of what value should be copied. The left-hand side always specifies what is overwritten. So it works for the LD, LDI, ST, and CPR instructions. It also works for all everything that makes use of the ALU, so that would be add, subtract, and or not. So all of those instructions, if something is changed, it is always the operand on the left-hand side, which is consistent with the C notation, because in C notation, in an assignment operation, whatever is updating is on the left-hand side. So that's why I chose that particular syntax. And, and then after that, we get to a halt instruction at location 0E, and that's how the program stopped execution. All right, so do we have any questions about the whole process? Because you can, this is the entire process, how you write the program, put it into the source tab, and then you go through this entire process so that you can visualize exactly what happened during the execution of the program. Are we good with that, that process? Do we have any questions about this process? Especially, you know, just, you know, what do we do after this step? What do we do after that step? And so on. Do we need any clarifications? No questions? Okay. So one thing you can do is to maintain your own catalog of the lecture. So every time I talk about a new topic, you just write down the timestamp. Okay, you just, you know, look at your watch, Look at your, your cell phone, find out what time it is, and then just jot down at 9.18, Tech is now transitioning to talk about but the next topic, whatever that turns out to be. All right. Are we good so far? Okay, all right. Okay, so now that we know how to trace the execution of a program, we can now, now by the way, this approach works regardless of your operating system. So it will work in Windows, it will work on a Mac, it will work on you know, um, a Linux box, okay? Um, so that means, that makes it kind of universal you know, as an approach. It is cumbersome, that I have to say. All right, so now the next topic, we have already gone over the compiling C control structures module. So we are now moving on to the next one. I'm not sure how many people are still reading ahead of you know, the, what the lecture is. So we just talked about the you know, TTP ASM plus emulator plus tracer. This is the custom thing you know, that a student wrote you know, five years ago. It still works, okay? You know, but I have not personally used it much. Um, this is the slide that we were just on, okay? You know, how to do this manually. Um, so now the next topic, the real topic that we want to talk about today is how do we call and return from a subroutine? So we'll go ahead and make a new tab out of this, okay? And the whole thing starts off with an example as a C program. So we look at this C program and we want to see, I want to see if there are any questions about the C program itself. The left hand side, the 001 all the way up to 010, that's just a line number so that we can, we can refer to which line as we talk about this. But do we have any questions about the behavior of this program? What it is, ex what you expect it to do, um, and so on. What does it do? Okay, by the way, so what, what does it do exactly? Other than useless, it calls function f, right? Twice from main. So that means the first time we call function f, 
Some of the vets said, I got nothing to do, no, nothing to do time, fine. So when F returns the first time, which line does it return to? Where does it return to to continue execution in the caller, which is main? Come on, you should know this answer. Line eight, very good. So it should continue execution on line eight, and guess what line eight is gonna do? Call F again, which is pointless because F does not do a single thing, but it will still go through the motion. So it goes to F again, F returns again, but this time, the second time, where does F return to? Which line does it return to? <laughs> Come on, do you guys know the answer? The second, from the second invocation of F, where does F return to in main to continue execution? Line nine, very good, okay, excellent. So that points out one thing. The JMPI instruction won't be able to get this done because JMPI is only going to return to a location that is determined at assemble time, which means it cannot change at runtime. So that means you know, the return mechanism of the subroutines, where is how it knows at the end of function f to where to continue execute, where it goes to continue execution, that is something that cannot be done using JMPI because JMPI, whatever it goes to, is determined at assemble time. As opposed to this is something that can only be determined at runtime because it depends on which invocation are we talking about? Are we talking about the invocation from line seven or are we talking about the invocation on line eight? So that means the mechanism to call and return is not quite as simple as just a JMPI to F and then another JMPI back to you know, whatever is after the first invocation, first invocation of F because that's not gonna give you the ability to return to where you need it to be. So now the question is, how do we get it done? Okay, so that's the question. Keep that question in mind <clears throat> as we do a quick digression to talk about the stack. So let me kind of increase the font size a little bit here. So this portion or this section here talks about the concept of a stack. A stack, like a queue, is basically a way to store something and to retrieve something. When you're at a store, okay, you've got your item and you want to check out, how do you call that as a data structure? Is it a stack or is it a queue? When you line up to pay for something at Walmart or Costco or Safeway, is that a stack or is it a queue? It's a queue, very good, okay? It's a queue because it is first in, first out, okay? Whoever got to the line first is the first one who gets served, okay? The last one, per, la, the last person to get to the line is the last person to be served, okay? Or at least you know, we would want it to be like that. Is that good? So by, in contrast, what is a stack in real life? In other words, you know, what is uh, something that can store something, like a container, but the way you put items in and the way you retrieve items is last in, first out. The last thing you put in is the first thing you get out. So what would be uh, something that have that particular nature? Hmm? A can of Pringles, very good, I like that. A can of Pringles, because the last Pringle is the one that you take out from the can. The, the last one that the factory put in is the first one that you retain, okay? But the Pringle can has one slight problem, is we usually do not refill it. <laughs> so think of an example where you actually have to refill the container once in a while, then you get something out, then you refill it again. I'll give you an example, huh? A spice jar, that's good too. The problem with the spice jar is it's difficult to distinguish you know, what you put in you know, a long time ago versus what you just put in. Um, if you're talking about uh, paprika or anything that has pigment in it, you can actually tell because if the pigment starts to, when it oxidizes, you know, it becomes uh, not as saturated anymore. 
I'll give you an example. It's a, it's a refrigerator. I think that's a really good example, okay? So it's an improper use, but the common use of a refrigerator is when you, when you get something, you're from Costco or Safeway, you bought your grocery, how many people would actually go to the refrigerator, clear out everything, put what you just bought to the back of that shelf, and then put back whatever you took out a little bit earlier so that you know the stuff that has been sitting in the fridge for a while is now the first thing you get out. How many people would do that? Nobody, right? Okay. So what we do is, okay, you know, we just push all the stuff already on the shelf a little bit more, make room, right? So all the fresh you know, broccoli that you bought, you know, all the fresh stuff that you bought, you just put it, you know, as the first item to get, right? So the next time you prepare your meal, you go like, okay, what vegetable do we have in the fridge? Ah, the broccoli that I just bought this afternoon, right? And then behind that would be the carrots that you bought a few days ago, and then behind that would be the cabbage that you bought last week, and then behind that would be an, another bunch of broccoli that you bought last month, okay? So is that kind of a common scenario? That is a stack, last in, first out, even when it doesn't, when it's not supposed to work like that, okay? So I want to relate this to things that you see on the daily life, in your daily life, just so that you can get a sense of, oh, so that's last in, first out, okay? The last item they put in is the first one that we retrieve. Okay, <clears throat> so in a computer, how do we implement a stack? <clears throat> Some people may say, oh, Tack, you're touching on uh, topics in CISP 430. This is way more advanced than we, than we are supposed to understand. No, you don't need CISP 430 to implement a stack. The concept of a stack can be done using just concepts that you have already learned in CISP 360. Using an array, a pointer, that's all you need. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is to take a look at the C code first and then we'll translate snippets of the C code into assembly code. So line one is here is really just defining the size of the array. It's just a good thing to do. <coughs> is to use a macro or a constant to define the size of an array. So we're just defining a stack, you know, an array of 32 items. Line two is the declaration of a stack. In this case, the so-called stack is nothing more than an array that has 32 unsigned A-bit integers, otherwise known as, it's almost like a char, but it's unsigned, okay? And then on the third line, we also declare another variable, which is sp. It is a pointer to an unsigned AB integer. And can anyone guess why the variable is called sp? Stack pointer, very good, okay? So this is our stack pointer. Um, the term stack pointer is actually extremely universal across all the architectures. The program counter is not very universal. Intel likes to call it the instruction pointer, when then the rest of the industry will refer to it as the program counter. But the stack pointer is universal. I have yet to encounter one architecture that would call the stack pointer something else. <clears throat> okay, so we have declared everything using this little snippet of code. So now the question is, um, where do we start the stack pointer? Because the stack pointer at this point is not initialized. So we have to initialize it so that we can say, okay, initially the stack is empty, there's nothing in the stack, and it has a capacity, in this case, of 32 bytes. So what we do is kind of, we read through all this stuff here, and it talks about how the stack is actually going to grow backwards. In other words, the stack pointer is not gonna point to the first element of stack to basically say, okay, the stack is empty, and that's why I'm pointing to the beginning of the stack from the address perspective. The stack grows backwards, which means the first thing you do is to point the stack pointer just one byte past the end of the array that is allocated as the stack. All right, so this is also why I got the tablet mirror you know, going on here because I want to show you <clears throat> what it looks like. So let me see if I can get there. Oh, it's sleeping, that's why it's not, okay. All right, so we have ARC. This is my Tuesday, Thursday class. Start a new notepad. Okay, so 
So um, the way I draw memory locations is you know high location is high up and then low locations are lower you know, down there. Okay. So if this is the stack that we were just talking about, <clears throat> so that means you know, as a variable, this is where stack is. S T A C K. Now why is that not working? Because I'm using the line tool. Okay. That is lame. That was my mistake. Yeah. That's why the, the rectangle looks so straight because you know I was using the wrong tool. Okay, let me switch back to the pen tool and use the right color. Okay, there we go. So the stack, the variable stack, is really referring to the start address of the array. Okay, it's at the beginning of the chunk of memory, 32 of those bytes, um, and stack as a variable name is referring to the bottom of the entire thing. So if you want to know how memory addresses go, so this is, you know, this, these are the lower addresses, and this, these are the higher addresses when it comes to addresses. Okay. What about SP? Where do we want SP to start with? Most people would think, oh, we want SP to start at the beginning, which is at the lower portion of the stack at the beginning. That's not how we do it, okay, for some reason that I cannot quite explain at this point. We'll be able to explain those reasons later on, but not right now, okay? So the way we initialize the stack pointer is all the way past the end. So SP as a pointer is pointing just one location past the end of the entire stack array, or whatever chunk of memory that you want to allocate for the stack. All right, so that's a weird thing, right? You know, because you know, why would we do that? You know, wouldn't that be a problem? Because when we want to write something to where, where the stack point is pointing to, we're going to be writing to a location that does not belong to stack itself. So we'll ex I'll explain why this is not a problem in just a little bit. So are we good with this picture so far? Are good? Okay. <clears throat> so now what we do is we continue with this discussion here. So we now look into what we call a push operation. So the push operation is the operation of uh, storing something in the stack, okay? That's also called a push operation. So the push operation is consists of two steps. The first step is we want to decrement the stack pointer, and then the second you know, thing that we are going to do is to overwrite the location of where the stack point is pointing to with the value that we want to store. So x is representing the value that we want to store on the stack, so this is how we push the value of x on the stack. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I go back here. So I'm, I'm going to say, okay, I, I want to push. Okay, so we I'm just going to comment here that I want to push a value of 12, which means I want to store the value of 12 on the stack. What are we going to do? Remember those two steps? What was the first step that we need to do? Decrement the stack pointer, right? So with the tablet, I can actually move the stack pointer, which also means you know, from your perspective, you might need to refer to different time frames in order to see how the stack is going to change in time. So you know, if you just kind of jot down the current time and then the future time when I move the stack pointer, that might be helpful. Okay, so I'm just going to lasso the stack pointer here, which gives me the ability to move it. So let me see if I can just move it. Yep, there we go. So now we move the stack pointer to just one location below. And now the stack pointer is indeed pointing to the last location of the stack. Is that okay? That's after the first step. And then what do we do? We say asterisk SP equal to 12, right? which means we are dereferencing the stack pointer. Whatever the stack pointer is pointing to, that location, I'm going to overwrite it with a value of, in this case, 12. <clears throat> so that means you know, now I'm overwriting this location. And I'm going to use hexadecimal here. So 12 is 0c in hexadecimal. So now we have 0c you know, stored at where the stack pointer is pointing to. So that's after the push 12 instruction or the push 12 operation. I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions because I have just talked about 
both conceptually that the push operation is to store something into the stack and also mechanically how we do that using a pointer that we call stack pointer. Do we have any questions at this point? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, so I'm assuming there are no questions that people want to ask. There may be questions, but you know, apparently not, nobody wants to ask those questions. So I'm gonna perform the next operation. So the next operation, let's just say that we are pushing the value of 56 in decimal. What are we, what are we gonna do? What are the two steps? What is the first of the two steps of pushing a value on the stack? That could mean the stack pointer, right? Okay, so I'm gonna do the, do the same trick here <clears throat> using my lasso tool. Okay, and now I move the stack pointer to the next location, the, the one right below where it was pointing to initially. And now you know, we have the second operation, which is asterisk SP, the reference SP, and then copy the value that I want to store at that location. So in this case, it is 56. So 56 in hexadecimal is going to be a 3, 8. Okay, so let's do a quick digression here. How do I know that 56 is 3, 8 in hexadecimal? Check has just you know, the, the first you know, 255 you know, numbers memorized in hexadecimal form. No, that's not that's that, that's nothing. That is that's that is not something that I would do. So how do I figure out that 56 in decimal is 38 in hexadecimal? <clears throat> how do you do that math? Hexadecimal means it is in base 16. Yeah, go ahead. So I think in terms of how many 16s can I fit in 56? Three of them. What is the leftover? Eight. So therefore, three eight. Okay? <clears throat> so now we store the three eight. Okay, I've got to make sure we're using the right tool. Okay, so three eight is now stored here, which is our 56. Are we good so far? So I'm gonna push one more item, but this time I'm not gonna explain you know, all the smaller steps. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna push another thing on the stack which is, um, let's pick something, negative five. <laughs> Just so that we can practice you know, how to do conversion from signed decimal number to binary representation in hexadecimal. All right, so how is negative five represented as an eight-bit number? Okay, there are a few ways to look at this. Okay, you can go through the whole, you know, um, Choose complement thing because you can you can see that oh five has a representation of zero 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 one zero one. If I take the choose complement of that, that will give me the bit pattern of you know what negative five should look like. That's one way to do it. The other way is to say oh we know ff is negative one, so fe is going to be negative two. So you just kind of use it use that method. So fe, fd, fc, fb. So I think FB is negative five, okay? So that would end up with FB being stored here. So let me do a, make, make sure that I got it right. D, C, D, E, F. So yeah, so that's gonna be FB. And then the stack pointer is gonna move again, right? You know, I, I'm doing this out of order, by the way, because I said, you know, I'm not gonna go through the individual steps. So the stack pointer is gonna end up here after push negative five. Is that okay so far? All right. So, all right. So now the question is, if I want to pop, okay, you know, the operation is called a pop, which is basically just saying, I want to retrieve something from the stack. I want to retrieve a single item from the stack, and I want to put it into some register, okay? So we'll just say register A, okay? So pop A is to retrieve an item and put it into a register. We haven't talked about it yet, okay? So we're gonna switch back to the C code to find out you know, the representation in C code and then we'll go come back to the picture to finish the operation. But before we do that, I just want to kind of move this up a little bit so we 
just so that you know, the bottom part is not hidden, it's not out of the screen. All right, so we go back to the slide here. Okay, we go back to the documentation. And then we, this is how we re retrieve an item, which is also called a pop operation. So you can see how everything is exactly the opposite from what it used to be, okay, in terms of the push. Do you see how in the push operation, the asterisk SP is on the left-hand side, but when, you, when we are popping, the same thing, the same expression is now on the right-hand side. Whatever value is supplying you know, what we want to push on the stack is now you know, whatever variable we want to use to store whatever we are retrieving from the stack. And then after that, <clears throat> we perform SP minus minus or decrementing the stack pointer before, and now it becomes SP plus plus, which is incrementing the stack pointer. But you can also see the operations are in opposite order as well. Before, in the push operation, we decrement the stack pointer first. But when we are popping, when we are retrieving an item from the stack, we perform this as the post operation. This is the second operation as opposed to the first. Okay, so you might want to kind of keep in mind of this part here. <clears throat> and then we go back you know, to our picture. Oh, okay, I think I think I can do a little bit better. I might be able to fit both the instruction and also the tablet on the same screen. Yeah, it fits, it's okay, that's good, okay. So now I can actually just read my own instructions, which is you know, how do we pop an item. So we can see how we want to retrieve whatever the stack pointer has. So that means you know, the first thing we do is you know, A, or register A, is now going to get the value of FB. Is that okay so far? Because that's the first operation. Whatever the stack pointer point is pointing to, retrieve that and put it into wherever we want to store that. So in this case, we are talking Z to register A. So register A, register A is updated by the hexadecimal value of FB. That's the first thing we do. What about the second thing? We increment the stack pointer. So in this case, I can use the lasso tool. <coughs> the cool thing is I can actually use both my tablet, um, I guess not. <laughs> Certain things can only be done using the um, stylus. So now we move this back up to one position, and this is the result of popping an item. You retrieve first, okay? You copy from the stack to wherever you want to pop the value into, then you move the stack pointer back up, okay? So you can also see the FB is still here. Okay, we are not erasing the location that we were popping from. We can just let it be and go like, okay, it's still there. So one thing you can use, one, one analogy you can use is to not to look at the stack pointer as a pointer, but look at it as a bookmark, okay? You have a stack of paper, a notebook that has multiple pages. Your stack pointer is nothing more than a bookmark that is defining, oh, by the way, this is the last item that we put on the stack. So when you want to store something else, then you have to first to move the bookmark and reserve the next page. Then you copy the content onto the page that you have just reserved for the new item. When you're popping, when you say, okay, we just want to retrieve the content of this page and then this page becomes recycled, okay? So, so what you do is look, you follow the bookmark, you go to the page that represents the last thing that you push you know, onto the stack, you copy that page to wherever you want to copy it to, and then you move the bookmark back up by one position so that whatever page had the content that you just popped is no longer quote unquote in use, okay? Because you have to keep moving the bookmark to remember what, what was the last item that I just stored on the stack that is not retrieved yet. All right, so is that okay so far? So you can see, you know, basically what usually happens when you have a lot of stack operation is the stack will grow in this direction, and then as you retrieve the items that you have stored earlier, the stack will go back up again, and then go down, up, down, up, down, all day long. So do we have any questions about the concept of a stack or how the stack is implemented by using pointer operations in this particular case, you're represented as C statements. <clears throat>
So I'll give you guys a little bit of time to kind of think about it and see if there are any questions. If you want to talk to each other, converse, you know, that's fine too. You guys are way too shy to do that. <laughs> I mean, would, would that help if I give you guys like five minutes to talk to each other and then continue with the topic? Would that help? You don't know? <laughs> All right, well, since nobody wants to take up on that offer, I'm continuing with the lecture then, okay? But if you say, if you really want to do this, but you're not really sure whether the whole class wants to do this, you can always send me an email and go like, I would really prefer to have some time to talk to my fellow students so that we can kind of try to understand the concept and or try to formulate a question to ask because we are not quite getting everything. <clears throat> Sorry? Huh? Oh, okay. All right. So, <clears throat> So what is left, okay, is just one thing. How do we initialize the stack pointer in this case? So the way we initialize the stack pointer in this particular case is just this. I'm using pointer arithmetic. Um, in other words, I'm taking the array stack and I say plus stack size. Pointer arithmetic is basically the, almost the same thing as using the square bracket. I'm basically extracting the theoretical address of an element of stack that does not exist. Because if you put square brackets around you know, these, the highlighted stack size, it is not referring to the last element of the stack. It's referring to one element past the end of the stack. Okay, So that's how we initialize the stack point. All right. So now the question is, how does that relate to calling and returning? So calling and returning is, this is actual assembly code. So now we are switching to assembly code. But before we do that, let's go ahead and think about how to implement SP minus um, minus and you know whatever the stack pointer points to is whatever register I want to use and say, hey, store the value in this register on the stack. And in the opposite is to store whatever the stack pointer is pointing to into a particular register and then increment the stack pointer. So of all the registers that we have talked about so far in this class, did, have I ever mentioned a stack pointer in PPP? Okay, so we try to remember all the registers that we have talked about. We got the four registers in the register bank A, B, C, D. We have the program counter. We have the flags register. We have the instruction register. We have the program counter. We have the microcode pointer. Okay, that's it. There's no such thing as a stack pointer in PPP. So how are we going to get this done? Easy peasy. All we have to say is from now on, register D is considered the stack pointer. That's all we're going to do. Okay. So this is an approach of a general purpose, um, general purpose register processor where all registers are truly equal. There's no such thing as a special register called a stack pointer. We just have to designate a register to do the job of a stack pointer. So in this class, the convention is, I'm just going to say, register D, you are now the stack pointer. So is that OK so far? There's no such thing as a real dedicated stack pointer in TDP. We are basically just using register D as if it is the stack pointer. We good so far? OK. <clears throat> so if that is OK, then we can now look into how do we call and how do we return. So the way we call a subroutine is this, okay? There are multiple steps, but each step is commented. So hopefully the comment is going to kind of help to make sense. So the way we do calling is we're going to have to store the return address first, okay? <clears throat> so we'll go through these five lines you know, one by one, and hopefully it will start to make sense. The first line, remember, register D is now our stack pointer. So every time you see register D by itself, we are working with the stack pointer. So we decrement the stack pointer, which, which is the same thing as SP minus minus earlier. And then we put whatever value we want to store into register C. In this case, it's L1. So L1 is right here. What L1 is representing, as the comment is suggesting, 
is the continuation point of the callee in the caller. In other words, when the subroutine that we're invoking, the subroutine that we're calling, when it's done, we want it to continue execution here. Okay? So L1 you know, only serve that one single purpose, is to designate where do we want the subroutine to return to. Okay? So we store L1, the, the continuation address, into register C, and then we push, we store register C to where the stack point is pointing to. In other words, lines one, two, and three, they accomplish one single thing, which is push L1. We are storing the continuation address on the stack. Is that okay? All right. In other words, we are leaving breadcrumbs behind so that when the subroutine is done, it can follow the breadcrumbs and know how to return back to where it's supposed to be. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so now what do we do after that? Okay, after line one, two, and three, we simply perform a JMC I to F when we are calling subroutine F. In other words, this is the time when we transfer control or we continue execution from somewhere within the main program at the first line or the first instruction of the subroutine. So this together, okay, this entire thing is doing what F open and close paren semicolon is doing in C. Are we doing okay so far? All right. <clears throat> So what about the perspective of the subroutine itself? You know, when we get to the end of the subroutine, what is it going to do? It has to do a return. So how do we return? This is how we do a return. So basically, we do a pop operation here. Lines one and two is really just a pop to register A. Why? Because the first thing we do is we are dereferencing the stack pointer, which is register D. And whatever that location has in RAM, we're copying that to register A. So this really is doing the same thing as <clears throat> what we did, what we specified a little bit earlier, which is line one of the pop code. So are we okay with that? Okay, let me let me switch to the tablet here. LD. Oh, okay, once again, I'm using the wrong tool. Oh, it's sleeping. That's why. <clears throat> All right, so LDAD with the comma is really the same thing as um, register A gets whatever the stack pointer is pointing to. Is that okay? All right. So it is important that we understand, you know, what LD and ST are doing, and that way we can make the association with the D code that is also express trying to express exactly the same thing. So this is the reason why we have to be familiar with the opcode or the instructions <clears throat> in order to get to this part of the, of the class because we are now relying on the understanding of the individual instructions in order to combine them to do something, to do something that is more useful. Okay, so if you are not familiar with what ST is doing, what LD is doing, and so on and so forth, now would be a good time to make sure that you do. Okay, you know, we have a longer weekend. <clears throat> if you don't have classes on, a, if you have classes on Friday, you have a longer weekend. If you don't, you know, it's a usual weekend. But nonetheless, it is a good time to go back and review what the instructions are doing. Not so much how they get it done, but what they do. Okay, so that is also the reason why it is important to go to the trace ability using the assembler. So when you go to the assembler, you go to the analysis tab, this really shows you how things are done, okay? We're getting to that location, whatever that location has is now retrieved, and we put that into this register, and so on and so forth. So you can actually visualize the whole thing happening using the trace uh, over here, you know, the analysis. <clears throat> All right, so getting back to the calling. The G? In where? In the assembler? Here or? Oh, okay. That's uh, yeah. That's poor payment tree. That's what it is. Poor payment tree. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> 
Let me let me redo that. <laughs> Is that any better? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> no, it's not. Now it looks like A7 and the D in parentheses. Okay, let's do that again. <clears throat> Register A with whatever is in D. There we go. All right, so getting back to uh, the <clears throat> lecture material, okay, or the reading material. This is actual reading material. Um, so to return, the way we do it is exactly the opposite. We pop the return address into a specific register. This is register A here. This is equivalent to SP++. We are just incrementing the stack pointer. Remember, register D is now being used as the stack pointer. So line one and two is being just say, oh, pop whatever is on the stack into register A which is the return address, right? This is something that we haven't seen before. Line three is using JMP without the I. It's basically using a register to tell us where to continue execution. This is the first time. This is the first time that we see JMP with a specific register instead of JMP I with the address that we want to continue execution. So now the question is, so what does it do? <clears throat> Well, the, the way we figure out what it's going to do is to go to the, uh, we go to the um, opcode table, okay? So we go to shared, we go to processor, we go to the opcode table, and then we just look up JMP. So JMP is one of the earliest instructions that I have to, that I had to implement because it is actually kind of the core thing that I had to do. And as you can see, the JMPX has a bit pattern of 1011XX01. So the XX is specified to which register we want to use for X. But when you look at the RTL description, RTL stands for <laughs> it's in the exam. I have mentioned that term many times in the class. It stands for register transfer language, okay? So it is describing what the processor is doing by saying, oh, this register is getting this value from that thing that has to do with some other registers. So in this case, PC, the program counter, is simply overwritten by whatever register X has. In other words, we take one of the four registers in the register bank, and, when, and then we use it to overwrite the program counter. So tell me again, what is the job of the program counter? And don't tell me it's counting programs. What does it do? It is important in the fetch cycle of executing an instruction. And what does fetch do? Fetches exactly so it goes to RAM and it fetches the next opcode into the instruction register exactly, and the program counter is telling the processor where to go. In other words, if you change the program counter, you are changing the path of execution. You are changing the location where you're going to get the next opcode. So by doing this, we are basically doing what we call an indirect jump. Okay, if you want to use the C term. We are performing an indirect jump based on whatever register you specify as X here. So getting back to the note here, so that means by the time we get here, register A has the return address, and as a result, it knows where to get back to in main. Are we doing okay so far with the concept? All right, so I'm going to kind of pause the, the lecturing because what I'll do next is to give you a live demonstration of exactly how all of this is going to happen. I'll give you the complete program that is equivalent to the C code at the very beginning of this entire module, and then we can actually see step by step how things are being used. How is the stack pointer being changed? What location are we overwriting? How do we retrieve the content at those locations? and what is the path of execution of the entire thing. So we'll get to see all that after we take a roll today. 
So rotating today is here. Let me make it visible. So now you should be able to see uh, 2023, November 8th. <clears throat> and then the rotating access code is compiled. So we are going to do this as a short break, and then we'll go back you know, to the code, and then we finish the entire you know, thing today. <clears throat> I'll just write the the word on the on the whiteboard. So this way we can see. Right. With that said, okay, I'm continuing with the topic. So what I'll do is I'm going to look at this code here, and then I'll switch to the command line to actually write the code. So let me mark this one. Let me switch to a my interface that that will work. I'm showing you know these side by side, so I'm going to call this program uh, call return .pppasm. And by the way, I also wrote a module of how to write how to save a file in TTPASM format as a plain text file. So you might want to read that because you know, I think today's lab may need me to upload something. I don't remember. You may not need to. Not today's lab. <clears throat> All right. So anyway. So now I'm starting to write the code. So we start with a no op operation here. And then we also want to initialize the stack pointer. In other words, you know, which part of the memory space is going to be the stack pointer. So this requires me to kind of show you the memory map. In other words, how do we make use of the 256 locations in RAM? So we'll go ahead and let's say this is representing everything from location 00, 0 to location FS. This is the entire RAM that we use in TTP. Your program is always filling in from the low end. In other words, location 00, 0 is the first location that we are going to get the first opcode. Why? Because the program counter is initialized to 00. 0. So that's the first location that we're going to grab the opcode. So that means you know, whatever your program is, okay, your program code, program code is starting at location zero zero okay uh, it just interpreted my you know, gesture thing and it goes up goes up to a certain point your stack is going to grow all the way from the end to the lower portion so this is where your stack is okay so we so this means you know, location FF is the first usable location on the stack so if I were to say, oh, but we want to initialize the stack pointer to be one location past the end of the chunk of memory, where do you think, how should I initialize the stack pointer? What happens when I add one to FF as an A-bit operation? FF plus one is, sorry? No? Okay, let's let's do that. Okay, what is FF plus one? So FF is one 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 and I just want to add one to it. Right? So um, I will do the usual, have one extra row for the case. So one plus one is a zero, zero plus zero is a zero, but we have a carry of one. So one plus zero is a one, one plus one is a zero with a carry of one. One plus zero is a one, one plus one is a zero with a carry of one, and so on, okay? So I'm not gonna finish this entire thing, but the point is the result is zero, 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 zero. So when you add one in a bit to one, 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 you get all zeros back. So that is how we're gonna initialize the stack corner. So when we get back to the assembly code, um, you can say, you know, LDID with a zero, okay, initialize the stack corner, okay, 
it you don't really have to do it because when you reset the processor, you know, everything is zeroed out. So that includes your register D. But it's good to have it explicitly stated just so that we know that the stack pointer is not uh, is not uninitialized. All right. So what do we do next? <clears throat> we have a JMPI to main because we want to jump around the code of for F. So this is the continuation of main, and we just have to write out, okay, what does main have to do? We're calling F twice, but every time we call F, what do we do? We have to decrement the stack pointer. We have to load the uh, return address into some register. We can use register A, we can use register B, we can use register C, it doesn't really matter. So in this case, it's the L1. So I now define L1 as the continuation point after the first call to F. And then what we need to do, now this is all just kind of copy from you know, what we talked about a, you know, a little bit earlier. So if I were to go back to the code, um, this is the pattern that we're looking at here. Uh, this one uses register C. It doesn't really matter which register you use. So we do STDA. So these three instructions combined is basically just saying push L1. We're saving the label value on the stack. And then we perform a JMPF to the function f. <clears throat> and now you know, we can, I'm a little scattered here, okay, so this is function f. Function f has nothing to do, right? If you look at you know, the original definition in C, function f has nothing to do, nothing to return. So we can get to the return code right away. So the return code is specified in assembly down here. So we'll just kind of copy and paste it. So we LDI a from whatever D is pointing to, and then increment D. So these two instructions combined is basically pop A to basically we, we are retrieving the return address that was pushed by the caller a little bit earlier. Okay, so now the call D, the subroutine being called, is retrieving the return address. And then the last thing we do is to do a JMP A to continue um, where the continuation where the caller um, okay. continue where the pushed return address is. There we go. So that means that we are going to continue continue at L1, and then at that point we have a second call. Okay, because when you look at the C code, we have a second call to F which means we can copy and paste, okay, because it's kind of the same thing, but it's not exactly the same thing. So I can do a, a copy and paste here. But we don't want to get, we, we, we do not want to continue at L1 anymore because we cannot define the same label twice. So this time we have to use L2 because the continuation point has changed. With a second call, it cannot continue over here because we just end up with a loop in that case. So we have to continue with a second you know, L label, which is L2 in this case. So that would conclude the program that is calling the subroutine F twice. And then at that point, we can just say halt, because you know, we, we cannot return zero when we are writing code in assembly in a processor like this, because there's no operating system behind the whole thing. There's nothing to return to. So when we get to the return zero in main in C code, all we can do in assembly language is to say halt, okay? We just there's no place to go back to. All right, so are we doing okay so far looking at this code, which is the assembly language implementation of the C code, which is kind of immediately to its left-hand side? We good so far? Okay. So the next thing we want to do is to run it, okay? <clears throat> so we want to save the file. Um, do you guys want me to do it the long way so that you can see one more time how to do it the long, the long method? Or do you want me to kind of shortcut this whole thing so we have more time to talk about the result of running this code? So are we still kind of focusing on the process of phrasing the execution of a program or do we want to focus on the concept of calling a return? That's your choice. Hmm? The long way? Okay, so we'll do the long way. 
All right, so to do it the long way, I have to copy this program onto the source tab. So on my computer, I can do this. Okay, obviously your computer is not going to do the same thing. <clears throat> um, oops. Press EL. Sorry. There we go. So now I have everything in the buffer. I go to the assembler. Okay, and go to the source tab. Paste into column A. So this is the program that I just wrote. Go to the RAM file, go to file, download CSV, give it a name, call red, okay, call return, press the enter key, switch back to the command line mode, okay, and then we basically run the program by just really changing, you know, the, the TSV file, I'll, I'll name it the same way, you'll call red. And then the CSV, which specifies the RAM content, is also called red. They're both you know, going to be in the temp folder. So is that okay so far? Okay. Press the enter key. It gets the work done. So now I have to upload and import TSV, the TSV file, into trace raw data. So we go here. We go to file. We go import. Go to upload. <coughs> I know there are quite a few steps, okay? I'm not saying that there, you know, that this is not tedious. But I have done this for years before I had the other tool that makes everything a little bit easier. All right, so we say import data. Okay, so now that that is imported, we should then be able to see the trace, you know, kind of decoded in the analysis tab. So there we go. So are we okay? All right. So you can see that if you use this particular method, there are empty lines. Unfortunately, <clears throat> it just has to do with the way the log file is created. Uh, so there will be some extra items where there are transitions of the things that the the tracing mechanism you know detects that has changed, but is not relevant to the decoding of what actually happened. So there are empty lines here. That's one of the limitations of this approach, but that's okay. You know, it's just, it's just that you have some empty lines that you have to scroll through. Okay, so what is important in this, in this case is you can see how D is initialized to zero, but it's not super important because D starts off with zero anyway. So when we get to main, we start to push the value of the return address on the stack. So when we perform a decrement D, which is SP minus minus, the stack pointer, which was 00, zero is now FF. And then we load the return address, which is 0E uh, e into register A. And you go to the assemble tab to make sure. So when you go to the, uh, when you go to the assemble tab, you can see how L1 is defined here. But the address that is corresponding to um, L1 is 0E. E. So this is what we're pushing on the stack, the address where the return should continue at, okay? So we are pushing 0E on the stack. So when we go back to the analysis tab here, we put 0E into register A first, and then we store that onto the stack. So this is significant, because this tells you that we are storing a value of 0E in hexadecimal to where FF is located in RAM, because this is a true reference population, okay? So that, you know, that's, telling you that we are overwriting location FF in RAM with the return address that main itself has stored on the stack by a push operation. <clears throat> then we continue execution. This is from main. We continue execution at the subroutine. The continuation point, you know, which is where the subroutine starts, is location 5. Now, how do we know that function F is at location 5? Once again, we go to the assemble tab. We look up the definition of f, which is here, and then we can see that you know, 0, 05 is indeed the location associated with the label f. Are we doing okay so far? Are we kind of cross-referencing things and understanding this whole thing so far? Okay. So getting back to the analysis tab, we are now in the function f, but it has nothing to do. So it's going to return right away. So the only thing it has to do is to retrieve the, the return address from the stack. So it is doing an LDAD because register D is the stack pointer. So it's retrieving from the stack, you know, the return address 
that turns out to be zero E, and then it increments the stack pointer because that location, the location where we retrieved the return address, which is location FF, is not useful anymore. So we increment the stack pointer, we move the bookmarks back up one page to indicate, oh, that page that we retrieved from is no longer useful as a part of the stack. You know, we can reuse that in the future. And then we, um, so after the increment D, which, is, which was FF, it became zero, zero. And then we perform a JMPA instruction, which means you know, the next location where we fetch the opcode should be location zero E. So now we move forward a little bit and we see that, oh, okay, we are indeed you know, continuing execution at location zero E, which is the starting point of the next call to F. So once again, we decrement D, which means we're decrementing the stack pointer. We then copy the label value into register A, which in this case is one four. Once again, we go to the assemble tab and then we look up the definition of L2 and make sure that that is indeed one four. That is the continuation point of the second call to function F. <clears throat> so we switch back to the analysis tab. <clears throat> And then we push that on the stack. We push the return address of the second call to the stack. So that ends up overwriting location FF again. Because remember, when you pop, it is basically saying whatever location you're popping from is now available again on the stack. Okay? Because all, all we are doing is we're moving a bookmark in the book, which separates which part of the book is in use and which part of the book is available to be overwritten in the future. Okay. <clears throat> All right, continuing on. So after we save the return address from the caller's perspective, we can now continue execution after the subroutine, which is a simple JMPI instruction. So once again, we get to location 05, which is the beginning of function F. It has nothing to do except to return. So once again, we retrieve the return address but the return address is no longer zero E, it is one four this time. So we retrieve that and then we increment the stack pointer. We move the bookmark back up one location to indicate, oh, that location where the return address was, we can now recycle that. It can be used, reused again in the future. And then we have the uh, increment uh, D, which, you know, which is the moving of the bookmark. And then we have JMPA, which continue execution at the location that A is register A is pointing to, and register A is pointing to location one four at this point. So that means the lo next location to continue execution is at location one four, which is where the halt instruction is, and that concludes the execution of the entire program. So what you can do is really to uh, use a piece of paper, and then you track where is register D pointing to, you might need an eraser because it, it does change over time. And then you also want to use a table as the stack so that you can keep track of which location of the stack has what content in it. Okay, <clears throat> But none of that makes any sense until you fully understand what each instruction does. So the JMP instruction, the LDI instruction, the LD instruction, the ST instruction, you really need to know what each instruction does in order to make sense of this particular program. L1 does not return. L1 specifies a location for the first invocation of F to be complete. In the program. Sorry. In the program part? In this particular program. Not The job of the stack is to remember where to go back to. In other words, the stack is kind of like um, a trail of bad bread crumbs. It, it let the subroutine understand, how do I get back to where I came from in the beginning? Does that answer the question? Okay, so if you're referring to the mapping in the RAM space, this is how it is mapped. Yeah, so, it's the so typically you would have the stack pointer, you know, pointing to, let me turn it back on again, it's sleeping. 
So typically what you do, you know, because this is the boundary right now, so the stack pointer, which is register D, is pointing to a certain location. So what this means, okay, so this is also helpful. What this means is, okay, let me use a different color because I can. <clears throat> so what this means is, at this point of time, this part of the stack is being used. Because the stack pointer is a bookmark that indicates, that separates which part of the stack is being used and which part of the stack is not being used. So the other portion of the stack that is not in use, okay, let me, this part of the stack is currently in use, <clears throat> but if I were to use a different color, so purple, so that means you know, the other part of the stack, which is this part here, is not in use. <coughs> and that's the job of the stack corner. It serves multiple purposes. It remembers where was the last location that we pushed something on the stack that is not retrieved yet. But it is also a separation of the chunk of memory of the stack and say which part is in use, don't mess with that. And which part is not in use, which means, oh, we can we still have some room to push stuff on here. Yeah, go ahead. Can I take another break? Um, sure. Come on, come on up. And what color do you want? Um, blue. Blue. We can do blue. We got shades of blue. You want dark blue, light blue, sky blue? Dark blue. <laughs> All right. Okay, have at it. It's more for this um, instruction when you say... LDC L1. Okay, LDI C L1. So it cannot have an LD because it has to be LDI. Yep, okay, LDI C L1. Okay, so, so let's say you put that, you say um, L1 is here. But L1 is not there. L1 has I, to be somewhere in the program space. Yeah, so you're, you're holding L1 here in the stack, and then, but it actually exists here. Not quite. Okay, so you're referring to the program, right? You're referring to the code that we wrote. Yeah. And you're referring to this instruction, you know, on line 12, right? Yeah. So what this does is to store whatever location L1 is labeling, which yeah. is the actual instruction decrement D. So the address of decrement D okay. is labeled L1. So we store the address of decrement D on line 17 in line 17 into register A. So that is also why in the trays, and you can see how um, when we when we did that instruction, you know, this is the instruction that you're referring to. Mm -hmm. So that's why we store zero E into register A, because in the assemble tab, when you look at where L1 is I located. Think we're saying the same thing. Huh? I think we're saying the same yeah. thing because I'm saying that like but when you line look at, 17 is here. Is but the pointing is not. I'm saying line 17 deck D isn't, it's over here. It's in this part. Correct. And then L1. The, the class cannot see where you're coupling, but it's okay. Oh, well, I drew a line. So it's, in, it's somewhere in here. This is where line 17 deck D yep. exists. And then on a, but in the in the stack. So the value of L1 is somewhere on the stack, but the definition of L1 is somewhere within the yes. program code. Yes. Okay. okay. So if I were to, <clears throat> if I were to kind of clarify this, there's a lot of undo to get to the removal of the L1. <laughs> um, okay. Next time I'll use a layer. So I'll give you a new layer so I can just delete the whole layer if I need to. Okay, so what is happening is L1 is a label definition down here somewhere. That is how we define L1. The value of L1 is stored on the stack after we push it on the stack. So that means you know, L1 as a value is stored somewhere on the stack after we push it. So, yep. Does that mean L1 is basically Yes, it is completely hard-coded. So it's not like some, I don't know, 
function pulling this memory location <clears> before <throat> and five. So what physically is it? It is the location. So L1 is nothing more than a bookmark of the address of whatever instruction that's right after it. So when the L1 definition is here, it would basically be, as, be defined as 0E because that's the location of the instruction or whatever is following it. Yes, based on what we have been introduced up to this point, yes, that's the only mechanism to do it, but there are you know, more interesting and more flexible mechanisms later on that we can say, oh, okay, this approach works every single time without the need to, to define a new label every time we want to call. Right now it's hard -coded. Correct, hard -coded. that is correct. So right now we hard code it, and it makes it more visible too, because you have to actually think about the whole thing. It's like, oh, when this subroutine is done, where am I supposed to continue execution? So you have to define that continuation point. So it is cumbersome at this point, but it's for a reason, you know, and then later on we can find a different approach to do this entire thing, and it's going to be a whole lot easier. Now, don't forget that you can always check the definition of the labels using the SIM tab. So when you go to the SIM tab, this is the symbol table. This is in JSON or uh, JSON format or JavaScript object notation. But remember, you can always copy and paste this. So you can just copy and then go to some kind of your know, JSON beautifier. JSON beeau -E -E beautifier, there we go. <clears throat> and then just paste that into here. Then you can actually see the definition of the label. So you can see how label F has a value of five because that's what uh, the RPM is. And then we can also see how L label L1 has a value of 14, which is which is our zero E. And then label L2 has a value of you know, 20 in decimal, which is our one four. So this is how you can interpret the symbol table text that is stored in the sim tab, you know, tab of the assembler. So you know, how often do you need to do this? I would say probably not very often because you can get the same kind of information go into the assemble tab, just looking up you know, where the label definition is. The label definition has a colon after the label itself. Okay, so when you see a label definition, the label is defined to be the next location. So in this case, it's 0E. Yep. Because one is identifying a definition. It's like, where do you put the bookmark, right? So when you say where you put the bookmark, there's a code. When you want to refer to, so which to page, bookmark. exactly, when you refer to what is the page number that the bookmark is at, that is without a code. So the reference is without a colon. The definition is with a code. You can only have one definition for a label, but you can have as many as many references as you want, you know, in the code. All right. So one thing you can all do right now is really just to have your own copy of the assembler. This is the one thing that is really kind of cool about Google Sheet is any one of you can now go to file, go to make a copy, and make a copy of this entire thing so that you don't have to replicate the entire experiment and still get exactly the same document that I'm referring to right now. So when you make a copy, I would probably rename the copy to something like your call return example or something along that line. So that way you the file name is going to identify, oh, this is a demonstration of calling and returning. You can even use a date associated with it. So that way you have the same date for the file as well as the video you know, when I upload the video. So now you have everything you know, as a copy. And then for the final exam, you can print out anything that you have saved including the spreadsheet here. But I would suggest that you read the spreadsheet and then just go through the spreadsheet, especially the analysis tab, to understand what is going on when the program executes and then write your own note, okay, to basically say, okay, now I'm getting you know, what this is, this is actually doing, what is the purpose of this instruction, 
and so on and so forth. You can also go ahead and print out the module itself, but not this one, but the other one, the module that we are on you know, today, and then annotate it, okay? So there are lots and lots of resources. You still have to put effort into it. I wish I could do a mind meld and transfer whatever I know about programming to you, then we'll be done in five seconds, right? You know, <clears throat> we don't have to go through the entire semester. Then, but then I would also be dumping stuff that you do not want to know. <laughs> yes? I get to what you're trying to say. <clears throat> well, feeling is not something that can be easily transferred because it's not just knowledge, it's not data, it is the experience. And the experience is, at least in the case of human beings, is hormonal. So until you, you, you have the same kind of you know, response in terms of hormones and whatnot, you, know, you won't get the same feeling. You just know the facts, but you won't be feeling the same thing. <clears throat> so it's pretty hard to transfer that. Um, anyhow, <laughs> um, the, um, this is your lab today. It only has six points. <clears throat> and your access code is GCC in this case, which stands for the GNU C compiler. Um, this is getting back to the topic before the exam, you know, which is compiling. So you might need to refer to that module you know, to answer some of these questions. <clears throat> And then the uh, the mod, I mean the the quiz itself also has some documentation, um, and it clearly states it is possible to use shortcut methods, the infinite monkey approach, to get through the lab quickly. But it is going to it's not a good idea because you know the lab itself includes instructions and explanations. So going through the lab slowly and taking notes as you go through the lab may be better for the long run. Okay, so that's just my suggestion. Okay, your people can do whatever they want. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna leave that lab to you guys, and the, the due date of this lab is the usual, which is uh, 11:50 for us. So it is now open. If you want to go, you know, take a break. That's fine. You know, get something to drink. That's fine. I'm gonna go get some water myself, and I'm gonna stop the recorder and have it uploaded. Yeah.